He was then blessed with a beautiful wife. Everyone knew her around the Sultan House office. You could see the women looked at her. The same look a man with gout looks at roasted meat. You know, pleasure you can't have but a poison you want to try. Brown, flawless skin with her eyelashes carved by a premium salonist. She had the bosom fit for a fertility goddess. Her hips protruded forth like Lebanon cedar and rested gleefully on a set of ebony feet that were ever in heels. Her extravagance was without consequence and like a spoiled child, whatever business idea she had was implemented without any feasibility study or financial appraisal. They expanded their land selling business and started property development. One such project was Golden Triangle Homes to construct four and five bedroom mansions at approximately 50 million. Amal Haven Homes, 50 million. Other multimillion projects were Vadura Groceries, an ambitious grocery supermarket for fresh farm supplies in upmarket areas of Gong and Hallingham. Then there was Orion Online Market, an ambitious way to be the next Jumia in Kenya. Then a series of other businesses, Golden Scape Architects, Golden Scape Logistics, Tunda Farmsteads, so many, we lost count. And like cattle being led into a slaughterhouse, the investors came in their droves. If you're rich, greedy, a taker, then beware, because there's always someone waiting to take it from you. In 2004, a British TV show, Hustle, Mickey Stone leads a group of highly skilled professional fraudsters. They pull a series of scams. But in each and every successful scam, one thing is constant. They promise someone something big at the cost of almost nothing. The victim believes that he is the one benefiting. Then at the end, to the agony of the victim and to the whimsical confidence of the fraudsters, the victim loses something big and gets nothing in return. In 2019, around December, a man known to Jen met her in Nakuru town. Jen was now established in her workplace, making good money and giving her son a good life. She also had good funds in her fixed deposit account. She was focused on making sure her son had a good education and at a good school. The meeting with this man was not by chance. He was an old friend who dealt with second-hand cars. He had met Jane with the intention of selling her a car. But Jane said that she was not planning to own a car at the moment. It is then, during that coffee meeting, that he mentioned gold landscape to Jane. Jane was still not ready to do an investment she had not planned for. He insisted, telling her that he had invested 320,000 shillings in June and that in December he was waiting to receive a check of 275,000 which he would be earning after every six months. Are you sure? Jane had asked. Yes, he replied. I will believe when I see it, she quipped, and hurriedly left to pick her son from school. Then, two days later, on a Thursday, Jane got a call from the same guy. He prevailed upon Jane to accompany him to Nairobi that coming Saturday. It was pity. She agreed because she wanted to see it, to believe it. They got to the venue, a construction site of the ongoing Golden Triangle homes. Catering was outsourced. Tea, coffee, fresh fruit, beautifully cut and arranged on a plate at each table. String cheese steaks and humans on pita bread. Lunch was equally exorbitant, but it was the presentation that caught John's attention. The CEO stroke MD stroke chairman was well dressed, articulate and smooth. He talked of the emerging markets in Europe, the greenhouses they were constructing in Somaliland and the one billion financing that he had secured in the UAE. Citizen TV cameras were rolling. There were other mo mobile cameramen walking around, snapping at the eager guests as the presentation went on. 
He talked of the ongoing project, an exclusive living haven that will be available to platinum investors. Then, to crown the evening, he presented the dummy checks to the investors. Jen's friend was among those who got the, his return on investment of 275,000 shillings. He sprinted to the dais, got his check, smiled for the cameras, and went back to sit amidst the applause of the mesmerized guests. Jen was more than impressed. She returned to Nakuru thinking of how lucky she was to have stumbled upon this opportunity. She watched the 7 p.m. news and saw the face of Peter Moridi Wangai again and heard his smooth voice say, We pay no stories. The following Monday, she called her bank concerning the fixed deposit account where she was saving. She requested to withdraw the full amount, all 650,000 of it. George and his carpenter friends from Witadia had also been convinced at the same meeting, all 10 of them. Since their business had grown to unimaginable heights, they agreed to take a loan of 3.2 million shillings so that they could each invest in a greenhouse, one for each member. Jacob from Narok was not to be left behind. He could easily raise money for three greenhouses. In his mind, he even contemplated venturing fully into the greenhouse business since he would make more money from a greenhouse than from his 80 acres of wheat in one year. They deposited their investment sum to Peter Moridi Wangai's account and traveled to the head office to sign the contract. On reading the contract, one was first struck by the first line, I salute you in the name of our Lord, he who gives us the power to make wealth. It is good that Peter Moridi believes in God. But what followed was a story. A story, something that was in sharp contrast to the assertions that they pay without stories. We were not able to pay our investors on 7th December, but we shall pay them in February. The story continued. And for another six pages, there was a story after story until they arrived at the summary page in page 7. The terms had changed, the profit margins had been stripped, and their waiting period made longer. But the unsuspecting investors had already deposited their cash and had no option but to sign the contract which was contradicting the initial story. They signed, they left and prayed for the best. Unknown to them, the storm had already started beating the business model that was on a toothpick foundation. To make it worse, COVID hit in 2020. Investors were still waiting to be paid, but the company was not showing any signs. Instead, they started rolling out new products, seeking new investors and asking current investors to roll over what they were expecting to another high-yielding project like the Tundestead. Investors were even asked to join the Golden Skip Circle and start owning a greenhouse with only 10,000 shillings. There were marketing offers where an investor could get a car or a house or something. And in one instance, in a marketing gimmick that was uploaded on YouTube, one investor who had bought nine plots of land was given a car. But a curious onlooker, upon suspecting that it was a gimmick, checked the team's account for the vehicle registration and found out the car belonged to Peter's wife, Anne Kanye. For the whole of 2020, no one was paid a dime. The coffers were drying, and the word that Golden Scape was not paying was starting to spread. It was just a matter of time before this was exposed as an elaborate Ponzi scheme. Its only hope of survival would have been if there was an infinite number of investors who would bring in money so that the likes of Jane, Jacob and George could get their returns. With an estimated 3,000 investors, the figures are astronomical. If each investor was to get the minimum payment of 275,000 every six months, it means that the firm has to have made annual earnings attributable to shareholders 
of 275,000 for each of the 3,000 shareholders times two installments. That would make it 1.65 billion. That is 1.6 with nine zeros. If this represents returns at 30%, then it means that the total earnings of GoldenScape would have to be 5.5 billion Kenya shillings every year. If this was the case, GoldenScape would have been in the league of blue chip companies. It would have been more profitable than Kenya Airways, five times more profitable than Bamburi Cement, and playing in the same league as National Bank. It was with this all that Jane waited and prayed that she would recover her money. She was no longer interested in returns, but recovering her money. The constant posts on Facebook that gave her hope were now no more. The YouTube uploads were long gone. The phone stopped going through. Golden Scape was no more. Jane had lost her 640000 and the future of her son's high school education. George and his Chama members had lost 3.2 million shillings and the dream of owning the biggest workshop in Dika. Jacob from Narok had lost 960,000 shillings and his farm inputs for almost three seasons. Peter Wangai had duped Kenyans over 18 billion shillings and an unquantifiable amount of dreams and tears. See you in the next episode.